Well, I mean, they're kind of the traditional notions of etiquette, you know, in, in, in your host country, which, you know, you can buy a book and read about. But I think fundamentally, you know, how, how we approach business, be it domestic or internationally, but particularly internationally, is the counterparty overseas, we, we essentially look at them as them having something that we need. And similarly, we have something that they need, you know. And, you know, we, we really kind of embrace this principle and really understanding those needs and understanding how we may be able to deliver on, on what they need um, really dictates kind of the dialogue. Um, this is universal. I, I don't think it's, it's particular to a, a specific culture, a specific region of the world. Um, but in principle, if, you know, if we can put our heads together and identify what those needs are and if we can craft a solution where we both benefit, then everybody walks away, you know, happy. Um, with regards to specific cu cultural considerations, um, don't let Saudis see the soles of your shoes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, learned that the hard way. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think I think fundamentally, you know, you, you want to do your homework prior to prior to engaging um, a, a prospective customer overseas, and particularly when you're planning a visit. Um, this, this is going to be a little plug for the U.S. Commercial Service. I think there's a lot of it, that information that, that the U.S. Commercial Service provides. Um, if you are actually planning a trip uh, and if you're seriously considering exporting a product or service, short of you know, getting on a plane and going to a trade show or, or exhibiting at a trade show, um, Carmela Service is by far probably the single greatest resource available to U.S. companies who are really looking to sell overseas. I mean, our tax dollars pay for the services that you know her her office provides, um, from initial market research to um, to the identification of, of prospective customers to actually arranging meetings and and hosting trade missions, which you didn't talk about. I think also oh, a, huge, a whole slew of programs. huge opportunity. <laughs> Um, but essentially, really kind of doing your homework prior to, you know, prior to engaging parties overseas. One of the good things is more people overseas speak English. You know, 30 years ago when I was going over there, uh, very few people spoke English. And it was uh, much more difficult to communicate and get your ideas of what you were trying to accomplish across where now um, a lot of the countries, English is really taught in the, some, from grade school up. It's a second language and uh, it's, I found it's been much easier the past 10 or 15 years to have those uh, discussions over there and being able to uh, tell the, the people that you're dealing with exactly what you're trying to accomplish from, uh, from the corporate standpoint here. I mean, I, I'll give you the, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, first, the good. Uh, now the bad. <laughs> um, our government, and oh, I think the governments around the world are, are following suit, are creating a substantial amount of additional compliance uh, as, it re as it deals with both individuals and businesses that have uh, operations in other uh, jurisdictions. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with what is called the FBAR, which is the Foreign Bank Account Report, that if you have uh, bank accounts in a foreign country and you have signatory or financial interests or other interest in it, and it exceeds $10,000 at any time during the year, you have to file uh, the FBAR report. If you do not file it, you're subject to, at a minimum, a $10,000 penalty, at a maximum 300% of the highest value that, uh, that was in the account for the past six years. Now, that's been in place uh, forever. The penalty used to be $250. It's now $10,000. Uh, because our government wants to put more teeth into this. I don't know if any of you have read about uh, offshore bank accounts, primarily uh, UBS in, the, uh, in 2009, where um, the government put exceedingly, um, an exceeding amount of pressure on the Swiss government to get the Swiss banks to 
turn over the names of U.S. depositors. Now, that has spawned two voluntary disclosure programs for people that uh, did not report the income from these bank accounts, did not file the FBARs, and they were required to come clean and pay not only a 20% of the highest value in the account for a six or eight year period, but if you think about the fact that the markets kind of crashed in 2007, you have situations where people, the highest value maybe have been in 2006, the value was cut in half when the market crashed in 07, and they're paying a 25%, currently 28.5%, a 27.5% penalty on the highest value in that account, plus picking up the interest and the dividends, plus paying a tax, plus interest, plus a 20% accuracy penalty. Now, what has this spawned? This has spawned a thing called FATCA, which is called the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. And some of us in the trade call it the Fat Cat Act, but that's an inside joke. Uh, what it requires is that if you have foreign assets and you are, as of uh, 2011 filing tax season, they equal $50,000 during the last day of the year or $75,000 at any time during the year. And there are other plateaus depending on whether you're married, whether you have a joint account with your spouse, whether you're living outside the United States. But if you meet that, those thresholds, you have to file Form 8938, which is called the Statement of Specified Foreign Financial Assets. Every individual that meets the threshold for their 2011 tax return are going to have to file the 8938 in addition to the FBAR. Now, there are uh, criteria for uh, not having to report things in two different places. There are a number of forms that you may or may not be aware of, but if you have an ownership in a foreign entity, you have to file a form 5471. If you're filing the 5471s, you don't have to repeat that on the form 8938, but you do have to check the box that says that you are filing the 5471. All of this is designed to get U.S. taxpayers, and by U.S. taxpayers, I mean citizens, resident aliens, green card holders, get them to comply and pay the U.S. tax on income that's being generated in these foreign accounts. So that is, um, that is a form that is, as I said, is currently only applies to individuals. However, if you look at the form, there are boxes to check off that I believe when the, when the IRS issues uh, uh, regulations in this regard in 2012, which they said they are, that it's going to apply to all U.S. taxpayers. Corporations, partnerships, LLCs, uh, trusts, um, I, it's just, it's, it's something that's coming. Right now, it's only for the 2011 year. It's only for individuals. Um, there are different ways that you have to calculate the highest value. There are some bizarre scenarios. For example, if you have the asset on, on January 1st and you were to sell all of your financial ass, foreign financial assets on January 2nd, you still use the exchange rate at December 31st which is 11, 11 months and, and uh, 28 days after you've sold the asset, which makes no sense to me. Uh, you don't have to file the form if you're not subject to having to pay, uh, file a U.S. tax return. So you have in some inconsistencies with the FBAR in that you have to file the FBAR because it's not a tax return, it's a report if you meet the criteria of the 10, 000, more than $10,000 in foreign bank accounts, but you could have a million dollars if it's all in municipal bonds and you don't have to file a U.S. tax return, you don't have to file the 8938, but you still have to file the FBAR. So if I've confused you on a higher level, 
I apologize for that, but now we're going to get to the ugly. Um, the ugly is, is that effective for tax year starting in 2014, there are going to be withholding requirements placed on foreign financial institutions. What is going to happen is that any foreign financial institution that's banks, uh, brokerage houses, uh, hedge funds, anything that is foreign owned, they are going to have to come forward if they choose to and comply with the, the government's requirements. And the government's requirements are that they have to turn over the names and all pertinent information on all U.S. investors. Now, if you think about this, for the bank to do that, they have to identify all of their investors. Because how do you know a person's not a U.S. person unless you look into that person's situation as well? So what has taken place here is that the European community is a little bit up uh, in arms about this. First of all, they're saying it gives U.S. banks an unfair uh, competitive edge. Secondly, <clears throat> they say that it's going to take somewhere between 10 and $15 per account to identify who's a U.S. person and who is not a U.S. person. Now, if you want to take this to the nth degree, so I'm told that in Japan, savers often maintain several small bank accounts. And there are currently 800 million bank accounts in Japan. If you do the 10 to $15 per person, it's going to take anywhere from 80 to $120 million a year for Japanese finance, foreign financial institutions to comply with the U.S. government. I mean, staggering amounts. They're going to have to change all of their software. And what is the significance of this? Well, the significance is as follows. The bank, the foreign financial institution has three choices. They can comply. They can say, we don't want any U.S. persons. And I'm finding out that there are a significant number of banks, particularly right now in, uh, in Switzerland, they don't want U.S. account holders. The third thing is that they could decide in their accounts not to have any investment in U.S. securities. Now, I don't think that's going to happen because if you're a portfolio manager, it would be tough to balance your, 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 your client's portfolio and not have any U.S. securities. So what is this all getting to? Well, the foreign financial institution must, by June of 2013, agree to comply. Starting with January 1, 2014, for those institutions that do not comply, there will be a 30% withholding on every dividend and interest and other income type payment that is going to come from a U.S. company to that foreign financial institution. Secondly, starting January 1, 2015, that 30% withholding is going to be required on any uh, stock tra uh, transactions. So, I mean, if you think about that, you have a situation where all of the U.S. companies that are paying dividends, all the institutions' dividends that are paying dividends and interest, are going to have to withhold on any of the monies that go to that foreign financial institution. And then starting in 2015, the same is going to be true on any security transactions. So you could have a situation where somebody bought a stock for $200,000, and let's say they took a bath on it, and they sell it for a hundred thousand. Well, there's going to be a thirty thousand dollar withholding on a stock that they had a loss on. They're going to end up with seventy thousand dollars net of their two hundred thousand dollar investment. 
So the reporting requirements are getting they to can, be... They can file a return and get some of that back. Yes, it's they like, can. It's, it's like withholding, it's, any kind of withholding. You any can withholding, you, but, but it's going to force people who have foreign financial accounts to comply. And the way the government thought that they'd get more teeth is to have the financial institutions be the one that have to account for who is and who is not a U.S. person. Sounds like a business opportunity for somebody. <laughs> Thank you. Typically, when you have uh, employers going either way across the ocean, you find because of the differences, for example, if you send a U.S. person overseas, because the differences in housing can exist, you find that you end up having to um, pay for that U.S. person's housing overseas because the, the standards that we have here in the U.S. oftentimes are much higher than they are over there and you have to find comparable housing for your employees there. And also in both going both ways, there's usually a gross up for income tax because you find that, uh, for example, people who come here, they don't have in the European countries this concept of state tax and city tax so that their tax rates tend to be lower than ours when you do the effective rate of federal maximum 35 percent New York State and New York City you end up with an effective total rate of about 43 percent if you're bringing a managing director or any employees over here typically they're probably paying less tax in their home country than a 43 percent tax rate now that's not true if you're sending somebody over here from Sweden where their effective tax rates are like 55% on about 100,000 uh, equivalent U.S. dollars. So, you know, there's always these gross-up things that have to take place in order to um, make your, uh, your, your employee, no matter which way you're sending them, kind of have them even out as if they would end up net-net with what they would have had if they hadn't gone overseas or haven't come here. Uh, and that's what, you know, we do a lot of that for, for, uh, for companies.